can only imagine I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun I can only imagine when all I will do is forever forever worship you Well, good, good morning. Welcome to worship this morning at uh, St. Andrews, whether you're joining us in the church in person, joining online. I hope you'll find a time of refreshment and re-energization. A couple of special welcomes. Sitting at the front is Andy Stinson, who's Bishop's chaplain, and he will be uh, helping us continue our series in Luke later today, uh, looking at some of the teaching of Jesus uh, as uh, recorded by the uh, Apostle Luke. And also, uh, kind of two-thirds of the way back on this side, Mark and uh, Diane, Mark, perhaps you <laughs> wave or stand up, uh, who, uh, Mark is our new vicar, starting in uh, about a month's time, so uh, exciting, <laughs> and uh, I feel like I'm on trial here now. <laughs> but as we come before our great God today, let's start in prayer. Almighty God, as we come to worship you this morning, we ask that you would open our mouths to sing your praise. Open our ears to hear your word and open our hearts to receive your love so that we can be strengthened to serve you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've just prayed that God would open our mouths to sing his praise. And so let's just do that as we stand to sing our first song. Song with the chorus, rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. Just 
the faith Come those with full or empty hands Find the riches of His grace Over all the world His people sing Show to show we hear that call The truth that Christ through every age Our God is all in all Rejoice, rejoice Let every tongue rejoice One heart, one voice O Church of Christ, rejoice Rejoice sit down. We turn to scripture now, to our Old Testament reading, which is one of the Psalms, a Psalm which speaks of God's love and protection. If you've got a church Bible, it's Psalm 91 on page 600. It will be on the screen as well. What I would ask is that we share in the reading of this. If I read the odd number of verses, please could you join in the even-numbered verses. Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the foulest snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night nor the arrow that flies by day nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra, you will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. We've heard of God's protection to those who acknowledge him and love him in that psalm. But so often we fail to honor God in the way we live our lives. But the good news is that through what God has done for us, through Jesus, we are welcomed back into his arms and into that protection. Jesus says, 
repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. We say together, God of mercy, we acknowledge that we are all sinners. We turn from the wrong that we have thought and said and done and are mindful of all that we have failed to do. For the sake of Jesus who died for us, forgive us for all that is past and help us to live each day in the light of Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal us and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Hugh will now read a passage from Luke's Gospel after which Andy will help us look at it in more detail. Good morning. Um, the New Testament reading is taken from uh, the Gospel according to St. Luke uh, from chapter 20, verses 20 to 44. Um, it's about paying taxes to Caesar initially. Uh, keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their duplicity and said to them, show me a denarius, whose image and inscription are on it? Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public and astonished by his answer, they became silent the resurrection and marriage. Some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leave a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second, and then the third married her, and in the same way, the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, the people of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the burning bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded, Well said, teacher. And no one dared to ask him any more questions. This is the word of the Lord. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you for the great gift of your word. May it illuminate our lives. Send your spirit upon us now that as we study it, you open our hearts and minds to hear your voice, to be changed by your presence, and to be sent out from this place, more aware of where you would lead us and how we can help to build your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, it's great to be with you. Um, lots of you are probably wondering what a bishop's chaplain does. I've been doing the job for nearly two years, and I spend most days wondering what it is a bishop's chaplain actually does. Um, I think the defining feature of my role is a little line in the job description that says, and other duties as necessary. 
Uh, it's one of those roles where you pick things up when they come through the door and you make sure they don't crash before they go back out again. Uh, the weirdest thing so far I've had to do is to rescue the bishop's dog from the side of a shed. Uh, you'll be delighted to know that Barley is fine and alive. Uh, but uh, it's one of those jobs where you pick things up as you go along. I wonder if you have ever faced a situation where someone has said something to you that just demands the perfect response. It could be uh, a question or a, a probing moment where you absolutely need to respond with the right words. I don't know, looking around the church this morning, uh, how you would fare in that situation. It could be that blessed amongst us are those absolute uh, warriors of words, people with wit and wisdom who can respond in a moment to give just the right answer, to smash it out of the park and to be able to do just what Jesus does in the Bible reading we've heard today. Could be though you're like me, fumbling a little with your words, not quite knowing how to respond in the moment. I tend to find that when I'm posed with difficult questions, the answer usually comes to me between 20 and 30 minutes later, about six miles down the road, as I've moved on to something else. And I go, yes, yes, that is the thing I should have said. The title that I was given for today's uh, service, which I thought was really intriguing, or for the sermon at any rate, uh, is Jesus isn't tricked. And I thought that sounded a really interesting thing to look at. Although I want to add just a little tagline at the bottom. And hopefully we won't be either. We're going to turn to our Bibles. Uh, so if you have got that nearby, that will be helpful to you. Uh, but we're going to just take a little step back as well to see where the passage that we've heard comes uh, within Luke's Gospel. We're going to see how we can learn from Jesus, our master, in how he responds to these difficult questions and dodges the trap that he faces. If you're trying to find uh, the Bible, uh, the Bible, well, uh, that's the book in front of you, or at least on your phone. Uh, we're in uh, Luke chapter 20, which is on page 1054 uh, on uh, the church Bibles today. In there, helpfully, the NIV has these lovely pithy titles which helps us navigate the text through and be able to just see a little bit of what is happening before and afterwards. Uh, and there we'll see that we are in a passage where the authority of Jesus is being challenged. We have a series of these questions and attacks on Jesus and his ministry. And in each instance, Jesus is able to fend off the attacks with just the right words, dodging the traps. And I think he does so with quite a consistent pattern. Jesus' ministry has reached the stage where he is beginning to garner the attentions of those in authority the chief priests and the scribes at the temple, the different sects within Judaism, and all of them are a little bit nervous about who he is and what authority he has. I think a lot of their fear has to do with the fact that they're concerned that he will upset their apple cart, that he will challenge their own authority. So we see that he has started to be followed. In verse 20, we read that there are spies following Jesus. Now all the way through the gospel narratives we encounter this same pattern again and again where Jesus receives a question or a moment from the crowd where people come to him with particular challenges and we see how Jesus responds in each of those moments. That pattern is really typical of how a Jewish rabbi at that time would operate the rabbis would walk around with their disciples in tow, following behind them, hanging on their every word. The task of a disciple is to listen to their teacher and to learn just how they'll respond in every situation. So again and again in Jesus' ministry, we have this same shape. A question comes from the crowd and Jesus answers. It's the format that rabbis used all the time. And it was a format that was very open, but did lead to these moments of challenge. Normally, the questions that Jesus would face would be rooted in curiosity, 
in people trying to understand more about their teaching so they could learn more about their faith, and particularly the disciples behind who would follow and listen and learn. But those who were in opposition against Jesus knew there was a vulnerability to this method of teaching. Where most of the questions that Jesus would face day to day would be rooted in heartfelt curiosity, in wonder, in wanting to know more about God, the questions that we see Jesus facing in our section from Luke's Gospel today are far from it. They are barbed questions, finely honed and sharpened to try and skewer the unwitting rabbi who doesn't think carefully before answering. They're not just head scratchers. They're questions designed to give the uncareful rabbi just enough rope to hang themselves by, to get in real trouble with the authorities who surround them. So Jesus finds himself posed with two of these questions. The first of them in verse 22 is very succinctly asked. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, if you're a Jewish teacher, the answer to that question should probably be no, because the law teaches us that we should pay our tax in the temple using only Jewish or Hebrew money, uh, and they'd take that money and pay the temple tax. The downside was that the Romans saw things a little differently. The Roman tax authorities were not known for their compassion or their generosity. If anything, they were known for the crushing burdens they put on the people. So here we have a classic rock and a hard place. If Jesus says you should give your money at the temple, then he angers the Romans. If he says you should give your money to the Romans, he angers the Jewish people. What answer can you give? The second question we see Jesus facing is perhaps a little less succinctly asked and has its frame in a theological conundrum. The Sadducees come to him and ask, who will this woman be married to at the resurrection? Seven husbands, one woman. How does it pan out at the resurrection? The thorny issue here is the Jewish teaching on marriage. Marriage is between one husband and one wife, and a lack of faithfulness in that moment has serious consequences. Elsewhere in Jesus' ministry, we hear of the woman caught in adultery, dragged before Jesus with the threat of being stoned and put to death. To be unfaithful in marriage is an absolute no. But more so, the Sadducees really are trying to say that there is no resurrection as Christians, we have seen how this unfolds. We think the resurrection might be quite important. But they are trying to push their agenda on Jesus and draw him into their way of thinking. Two theological conundrums where Jesus has traps that he can fall into. Now, in both situations, I think Jesus follows a similar pattern to how he will respond. Firstly, he will respond with humility. Next, he will respond uh, by um, looking at the whole picture. And thirdly, we see Jesus' wisdom and his knowledge of scripture fueling his response. So let's have a think about each of those things in turn. Firstly, Jesus' humility. If we glance back to our Bible and just read on uh, a couple more verses uh, through to verse 44, I'll just read it for us now. Uh, it says, Luke 20, verse 41. Then Jesus said to them, why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord how then can he be his son? I think Luke puts this section in to help us understand Jesus' true authority. 
David is held up in Jewish thinking as the most significant king that they have ever had. Sure, his son Solomon is famed for his wisdom. wisdom. He was probably more wealthy and had greater political power in the countries around Israel at that time. But it is David who is held up as being the great bastion of Jewish kingliness, of Jewish authority. And Jesus paints a picture where he says, the Messiah is more important, carries more authority than King David does. He does this to be careful of his own trap. Jesus wants the people around him to know that he carries that authority. He knows that one of the reasons why the crowds surround him, why the awkward questions come on him, is they are asking the question, is Jesus the Messiah? Jesus uses that question to claim his own authority in that situation. Now, if we take that authority back to those questions, how is it that Jesus responds? The questions that Jesus is thrown are absolute barbs. They're there designed to trip him up, to undo his authority. I think Jesus would have been able, if he had wanted, to push those questions away without having to answer them. He could have used his authority as a rabbi to duck the issue at hand. Because we know that these questions are not sincere. If we turn back to the text, just at the beginning of chapter 20, we hear it, we read, keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said, so they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. Jesus could have called their bluff and declined to answer the question because there was no sincerity in the question. One thing that rabbis rabbis are famous for, and we even see Jesus doing it here, is pushing questions back on their audience to avoid having to answer things themselves. But Jesus offers humility. He doesn't duck the question and say it's beneath him. He doesn't try and dodge the difficult issues. Instead, he gives an answer. He asks them to take a coin, places it in front of them, and says, whose face is on the coin? The answer, of course, is that Caesar's face is there. And he says, with rabbinic excellence, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's? His answer is rich in humility. Faced with the second set of questions from the Sadducees, he offers that same calmness, that same humility. Rather than throw the question away, because really it sounds to start like a theological joke, he takes it seriously and asks it. That's when we start to see Jesus looking at the bigger picture, that second attribute in how he answers each of these questions. Jesus doesn't want to get drawn into the arguments between the different groups within Jewish society. Jesus knows what his purpose is. His purpose is to come in rescue of God's people. His purpose is is to die for the sins of the whole world, to be raised again to new life. But the timing of that happening is to be specific, is to fulfill prophecy. So Jesus sees how his answer and how his approach has to fit in with that bigger picture. And he knows at what point he needs to answer. All the way through Jesus' ministry, we see these different groups coming to Jesus. It could be that it's the the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, or the Sadducees as a sect we see here. As we read on in scriptures, we encounter the Pharisees, the Essians, the Zealots, all of these different political groups, each trying to maneuver for their own power, for their own authority, and for their own ends. 
But Jesus' vision, Jesus' task is to save all of these people. His focus is on where God is leading him. So rather than becoming a pawn in someone else's game, he is able to fulfill the Father's will who sent him. And he does that by employing the third of the three things that Jesus does through his wisdom and knowledge. It's hard to catch someone out who is wise, who is smarter than you, who knows more than you. So let's look at how he uses his wisdom to answer these questions. In the first of the questions about taxation, in verse 23, as I've already said, he takes the coin and looks at the head and says, who does this coin belong to? The answer is give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God's what is God's. Here he avoids the dangerous answers by saying, that the power is in the person who holds the coin to give it to the right person. But Jesus is all about knowing the whole picture of the people of God. He knows and understands that all things belong to God. The real question Jesus asks is who does everything belong to? And while Caesar makes an earthly claim to that authority and to that money, the claim is just that, earthly. Ultimately, Jesus knows that everything belongs to God, since God has created all things. So offering something to Caesar may keep you out of jail, but it always comes as a second string to doing what you should do in honour and glory of God, who owns everything. The second question, focused on marriage and the resurrection, as I said, is posed to make the resurrection look ridiculous. In verse 27, we're reminded that the Sadducees as a group of people don't even believe in the resurrection. So they're coming to Jesus to try and pour scorn and ridicule on the belief that the resurrection is important. But Jesus' answer takes us in an unexpected direction. It takes us back to one of the key texts in the Jewish understanding of who they are as God's people. Moses' encounter with the living God at the burning bush. It is in that encounter that God reveals himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the true and living God. This is an answer embedded in the whole narrative of God's people. He uses the whole picture, the wisdom and knowledge he possesses to be able to give an answer. God is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. And for him to be the God of Jacob, of Isaac, and of Abraham, then he must be alive. We can tell it's a good answer because we read in verse 39, one of those challenging him says, well said, teacher, and a silence follows. And those dangerous questions cease. So how does Jesus avoid being trapped? By offering humility, wisdom, and knowledge. So how can we take those things ourselves into our own lives and try and avoid being trapped ourselves? The question comes, where and when do you think you might be trapped? I want to offer two shapes of answer to that question. I think there are moments within the church where we manage to trap ourselves as well, or one another. There are moments in the lives of churches where tensions run high, where difficult questions are asked and answered, not always with the grace and sophistication that we see in Jesus. And we need to know in those moments how we should treat one another. When we hear difficult questions asked of us, We need to search for humility, for the big picture, and of wisdom and grace to be able to answer well. One of the questions we need to ask is, who is asking the difficult questions? Why are they asking the difficult questions? Jesus' knowledge of the big picture helps him to see how those questions fit together. 
in terms of the local church here, I'm sure there are questions about what we might do as a church around our approach to theology, to mission, to how we care for one another. Moments when visions that can be contrary to one another are painted. I'm sure there'll be moments in how the church was led by Christopher will be different from how the church might be led by Mark. Because the moments within the church's life shift and change. But our need for humility, for the big picture and for wisdom are still the things that help us through those difficult circumstances. When we look more broadly in the church, there are moments afoot where the church challenges itself, where tensions can run high. But we must ask ourselves, which of those things are of primary importance, where it really matters that we get the answers right? And which of those things are of secondary importance, where there might be space for love, for grace to draw us together? We must be prepared to let some of those things go in order to focus on what is most important in proclaiming the good news of Jesus, in deepening our own faith and our own trust in him. But we must hold at all times to the truth that God has given us, the truth God reveals to us in scripture, because those are the basis of how we understand God in the first place. There are moments too when we might find ourselves being tricked and trapped by those outside the church. Conversations with staunch atheists, questions around moral and ethical issues which society poses to the church. There are moments when we need to tackle those issues head on. But there are moments where a more soft approach may be more appropriate. And it's there that our humility, big picture thinking and wisdom can find us through the conundrums to the best path to walk along. If we are to be equipped to deal with the big and difficult questions when they come, then we need to recognise we need to be like the disciples, following Jesus, listening to his words, and allowing ourselves to be shaped by his thinking, so that when we must stand in place of Jesus, we can follow him. To that end, continuing to read our Bibles to grow our wisdom and knowledge, continuing to be led in prayer to be shaped by the Spirit are essential to us being able to cope with avoiding being trapped in the world. This section of Luke's Gospel has at its heart a desire to see the authority of Jesus through all of the different lenses of the people he meets. So let us recognise Jesus' authority on our own lives and follow him with humility, his vision and a wisdom that helps us to grow as the people of God, to seek God's kingdom and to share the good news of Christ. Shall we pray? Father God, it is your wisdom that we seek. The wisdom of Jesus Christ and his authority for our lives. As we reflect on the weeks that we have had, we think of those moments of conflict, of difficult questions, challenges which our faith informs and shapes. Pray, Lord God, you would help us and equip us to give an account of Jesus' love in those circumstances. We pray for this church, for the task of sharing the good news here in Cheadle. Lord, when difficult moments of conflict come, we pray your wisdom and guidance. Pray for your energy and passion to share the good news. And we thank you, Lord, for the leading of your spirit to help us follow Jesus more closely and to see the kingdom of God come in this place. 
pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Thank you, Andy. Andy's challenge to us at the end was if we are going to resist those difficult questions, we need to be keeping close to Jesus. So let's now spend a moment or two reminding ourselves of what it is that we as Christians believe about Jesus. I ask you to stand and if able to join together as we affirm our faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as we say, though he was divine, he did not cling at equality with God, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a slave, he was born in human likeness. He humbled himself and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has raised him on high and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every voice proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We've just shared what it is that Jesus has done for us. In our next song, we're challenged to consider what our response to that is. As we remain standing, we sing, I will offer up my life in spirit and truth. Can I 
Hopefully you've received a copy of Newsline with information about services and things that are happening over the next few uh, uh, days and weeks. Perhaps I can pick out one or two things, but if I've missed things out, apologies. Tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, rather than the usual cafe, it's our coffee morning uh, for uh, Macmillan uh, and uh, I know people have uh, been baking cakes uh, for this uh, and so hopefully you'll come share the cakes and raise lots of money for this uh, good cause. Two weeks today is our harvest Thanksgiving. Rather than the usual uh, gifts of uh, uh, flowers and vegetables that many of you remember from our uh, youth. Uh, we're asking for donations towards Chelwood Food Bank and Barnabas serving the homeless in Manchester. Details of the sort of things that they're looking for are available on Newsline or if you ask uh, the church office they can give you details of uh, particular gifts that will be uh, welcome. I mentioned that uh, Mark and Diane are in the congregation today and uh, for those of you who don't realise the uh, service at which Mark will be officially made vicar, his institution is uh, on the 23rd of October at 6.30 in the uh, evening and shortly after that uh, on the 6th of November, we'll be having a memorial service, a service at which we can remember those people who have died with connections to ourselves, connections to uh, this church. It's been a difficult time over the last couple of years with the lockdown when people haven't been able to grieve properly. And this will give us a chance to share our thoughts, our grief, and also our thanks for the lives of people who've been important to us. So that will be on the afternoon of the uh, 6th of November, and it may be, even at this time, there are people you would want to have remembered at that service. There are also people you may know who've lost someone close to them, friend or family, who you would want to invite to uh, that service. I'd just like to close the notices by calling Andy back up here. You told us a little bit uh, about your job as uh, Bishop's Chaplain, uh, but uh, I don't think you spend all the time rescuing dogs. Uh, Barley. Uh, uh, Barley can get lost a lot. I mean, it's <laughs> so uh, what actually 
do you do as Bishop's Chaplain? Yeah, so um, I'm based Monday through Friday at Bishop's House, which is in Chester, just next to the cathedral. Um, the way the bishops in the diocese are working at the moment is all three bishops um, kind of have their administrative support offered from that one place uh, and try and work together from, um, uh, from Bishop's House uh, normally on a Tuesday. Uh, so it's an attempt to having a very collaborative way of working at the centre of um, the diocese. Um, and so the work that we do in supporting the, the bishops going off and doing their things um, is uh, about responding to letters and bits and pieces that come in, sorting out ordinations when they happen, sorting out new appointments uh, when they happen. Um, so we, we do lots of that kind of legwork that keeps the kind of work of the diocese going. Uh, and the bishop's chaplain's kind of job in particular within that, I, I have spent an awful lot of the last two years doing safeguarding shaped things. Um, it's unfortunately been a real kind of um, part of where we've been up to as a diocese. Um, and that's a, a work that we're going to have to keep going on with. Um, but what we're beginning to kind of focus on and, and trying to um, draw some of our work towards now is actually what we're looking at in terms of vision and how we work together across the diocese to try and grow God's kingdom. Uh, how we try and actually, you know, tell people the good news about Jesus and make sure that the missional kind of work that supports us being able to share that good news is as ha is happening in as many places as possible across the diocese. Uh, so that's kind of my day to day. Um, it, it's odd in that I was a, a, um, a vicar in a parish, a little rural village outside Chester. So it's slightly strange to suddenly be homeless on a Sunday, uh, but it comes with the great kind of opportunity to be able to come uh, and visit places uh, and actually see people on the ground as well. Because um, one of the challenges and dangers of sitting in a diocesan office is that we think we're dealing with lists of names and we're not. We're dealing with people, we're dealing with churches, uh, we're dealing with, um, you know, real places and relationships um, so being able to come and join in with these things is great for just being able to, to push some life back into those kind of names and places that I uh, deal with. Well, uh, Thank you again for coming and joining and sharing with us today but you've mentioned about vision, you've mentioned about things uh, going forward, how can we as people here in this parish in Cheadle Hume support you and the bishops in prayer? Um, the big thing I think kind of the year ahead um, is uh, you'll be hearing more and more about it over the next kind of few weeks. Um, we've just taken someone on for the diocese who's charged with kind of facilitating a big listening project uh, to try and grow and see what the vision for the diocese ought to be. Uh, and the, the hope is that that is um, grown from the parishes and the places within the diocese uh, where lots of that stuff is happening. So that sense of being able to join in with that prayer uh, together as a diocese about where God is leading us uh, and how we can grow the kingdom uh, is kind of the number one thing. Um, one of the exciting things I did this week was I wrote the vision prayer, which is going to get used. Um, so I apologize to, to Mark and yourself if you do use that prayer. In about six months' time, when you're really bored of it, uh, when you're really fed up of that one phrase where you just think, it's just not a nice way of trying to pray, uh, then it's that sense where... You know, where is our unity? Our unity is in prayer and worship uh, and being able to do some of that stuff. Okay, thank you. And now it is time for us to turn to God in prayer. I'll start by sharing the collect for today, uh, after which uh, Anne will lead us in our uh, intercessions. And so we pray. Lord God, defend your church from all false teaching. And give to your people knowledge of your truth, that we may enjoy eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world, and let us thank God for his goodness. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus, to hear us when we pray in faith. And I want to start our time of intercessions this morning by thinking about the Parker family. 
Andrew, Liz and their children, Esther, Joel and Ben, are working in Uganda with MAF, Missionary Aviation Fellowship. Andrew is a pilot and has been busy doing routine flights carrying missionaries and aid workers in Uganda and South Sudan. He was also involved in a serious medical evacuation a couple of months ago. Liz has been acting as a volunteer English teacher for local re refugees, a task which she finds both challenging and enjoyable. The boys are now in secondary school and Esther has taken on the role of Sunday school teacher. The family have been to this country on a very brief visit recently for Liz's brother's wedding. And so we pray for them as they have requested. We give thanks for the work of MAF and its partners in Uganda, bringing hope and healing to refugees and practical help to missionaries and aid workers. We rejoice and give thanks that the children finished a good academic year and are now settling back at school again. We pray for the MAF staff, that you will keep them safe during their many long journeys by air and by what well, sometimes not so good roads. We pray for those who have been affected by Ebola, that people will listen to medical advice to avoid spreading it, and that each sufferer will receive your healing. But above all, we pray that through their work and actions, the good news of Jesus may be spread to all with whom they have contact. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the witness of the church this week, particularly in places where the Christian faith is ignored and forgotten. We pray for those who carry major responsibilities as bishops and church leaders and are always expected to know what to say and do, whatever the situation. Give them compassion, wisdom and the mind of Christ. Specifically, we ask you to strengthen and give vision to our three bishops and all your church in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love and reveal your glory to the world. We pray also for Mark Pickles, very soon to become our new vicar. Guide and inspire him as he still lead, seeks to lead us in a new future. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Christians working in places of power and influence who make decisions which may affect many people. We pray for Christians in politics, the media, advertising and finance, that they may know how to act and what to say in order to be true to Christ. We pray too that we may examine our own power over others at home or work and use it responsibly by offer it to the one who laid aside his power and took the form of a servant. We ask you to bless and guide Charles, our new king, and give wisdom to all in authority especially Liz Truss and her new cabinet ministers, and direct this and every nation in the way of justice and of peace, that we may honour one another and seek the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray again for Ukraine, recognising that the Bible tells us that God has the power to make wars to cease. God of peace and justice, we pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons on both sides. 
We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them. We pray for those with the power over war or peace, for wisdom, discernment and compassion to guide their decisions. Above all, we pray for all your precious children, young and old, at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those whom we love, the special people you've given us, wherever they may be. We pray for our friends, the close ones, and those that we sometimes forget. Those with special problems, and those who need you but don't always recognise it. We thank you for each of them and what they give to us. Keep us faithful to them as you are faithful to us. Give grace to us, our family and friends, and to all our neighbours, that we may serve Christ and one another and love as he loves. Enable us to be faithful followers of Jesus as we face new challenges in our church life and in our own circumstances. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those for whom today will seem long and hard, for those in hospital or who are ill at home, those struggling with mental health, with despair or depression, those waiting so long for a new job or important news or a friend to call. We pray particularly for those whom this day will be their last. We name anyone who is in need in any way in our hearts. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them joy in your salvation. Heavenly Father, we ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we end with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Anne. As we come towards the end of our time of worship together, our final hymn reminds us that we are not doing our Christian life by ourselves, but actually we are working together, strengthened by God, built into a community of his people. John Newton wrote this hymn using words from Psalm 87, showing how the holy city is now comprised of those people knowing and loving God. Let's stand to sing glorious things of thee are spoken. Zion, city of our God.
at the end of the service, do stay behind, share a time of fellowship over tea or coffee, have a word with Andrew, have a word with uh, Mark and uh, uh, Diane. But in preparation for us going out into the world, let's pray for one another using the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. strong